a bipartisan group of former U.S. foreign policy officials, military leaders, and lawmakers are pushing for action on addressing climate change in poor nations. They argue it represents a major national security threat. Their plight is our fight. Their problems are our problems, according to an open letter signed by a group organized by the Partnership for a Secure America. That's a nonprofit group founded by former Congressman Lee Hamilton and former Senator Warren Rubman, uh, who passed away just over the course of the past year. And one of the signatories to that letter is uh, Vice Admiral Dennis McGinn. He's a retired Vice Admiral. He is uh, President and CEO of the Council, American Council on Renewable Energy. And Vice Admiral Dennis McGinn, I believe you are on the line right now, correct? Great to be with you, John. Good to be with you. Explain to me why you felt it was so important to sign on to this letter first off. Uh, it's been uh, documented over about the past five years, or actually six years now, John, that uh, climate change and the severe weather effects that go with it can act as a threat multiplier for instability in key parts of the world where the United States has uh, national security interests. We know that uh, for decades, and even beyond that, the United States military has gotten involved with uh, large-scale and occasionally small-scale humanitarian assistance, disaster relief operations. Think uh, earthquake in Haiti or the tsunami uh, back in uh, 2005. But uh, this, these are, uh, are scenarios that are going to happen more frequently and more intently because of severe weather. Too much water in the, in the case of uh, monsoonal rains and flooding, too little uh, water in the form of multi-year droughts that completely crush uh, the food uh, production capacity of, uh, of countries. Said another way, if we look around the world today, there are what we would characterize as fragile societies and fragile governments that, with the additional pressure of more frequent and more intense severe weather events, are going to become failed. And in in that failed uh, society or that failed government, you create a vacuum of power into which all manner of uh, bad people can rush, organized crime, uh, paramilitaries, terrorists, etc. We, we're seeing it happen in, world, in the world today. It would happen more frequently as climate change uh, increases the frequency and intensity of storms. Now, talk to me a little bit, Admiral McGinn, about the timing of this letter, the timing of this push. It comes, your, your letter, your event on Capitol Hill comes in a week in which sequestration is set to take effect. Do you think that your push for uh, some sort of action regarding climate change in the third world is getting lost in, in all of the news that's focused on sequestration right now? I think right now it is, but as you know, John, this is not uh, a problem that just popped up overnight, and it's certainly not going to go away overnight. Uh, this is the business of climate change and the threat to national security. So we're in it for the long haul. We want to carry this message that, uh, no kidding, this is a national security problem. We've got bipartisan uh, support uh, to deal in the national security context with climate change, and uh, now's the time to do it every year that goes by that we uh, do nothing in terms of having policies and making investments in terms of adaptation and mitigation of uh, of climate change we're we're deeper in the hole you, it, you mentioned uh, yeah I was going to say you mentioned the, this bipartisan support admiral in fact the former Clinton administration CIA director James Woolsey assigned on to this letter other Clinton administration officials include former Secretary of State Madeleine Albright on the Republican side you have former Reagan administration Secretary of State George Shultz uh, George W. Bush's Deputy Secretary of State Richard Armitage, and then 16 former members of Congress, uh, many of whom uh, took leading roles on foreign affairs and defense committees uh, on both the Republican and Democratic sides. And yet, despite this bipartisan effort, it, it seems like so many other things that go on in Congress right now, nothing can get done on this particular issue. Why do you think that is? Uh, I think that we have too much of a near-term focus uh, and, and too much of a local focus. I think that uh, in the business of national security, you've got to look out beyond the next business quarter or the next annual report. You certainly have to look out or even across uh, multiple election cycles because uh, this is a long-term problem that's get, that gets worse every year that goes unattended. 
and uh, we need to, as a, as a nation, not just in climate change, but energy, uh, for example, we need to really, really take a longer view and do the things today that we're going to be real happy in 10 years that we did. So give me an example of what you're referring to when you say, do things today. What types of things can we do today? What kinds of things can uh, Congress and the White House come together on that 10 years from now we'll look back and say, boy, it's a good thing we did that back in, in uh, 2013, 2014? I would say have the kind of, uh, of energy strategy that, and we don't talk about this specifically in the letter, but we have in, in various discussions, have the kind of energy strategy for the United States that puts us in a leadership position in moving to a clean energy economy and reduces the uh, production of greenhouse gases and then sets a standard for other nations around the world, China, India, uh, Europe, et cetera, to really, really uh, get serious about this, not simply because we're trying to avoid something like climate change, but which we certainly are, but because we're trying to create something which is a whole new industry centered around clean energy. I mentioned that uh, we have sequestration, which is likely to happen this week. And then just look beyond that this year um, in terms of things that the White House would le like to see get accomplished. You have immigration reform. They've spoken about some sort of uh, gun control legislation. Where do you think um, this this push for climate change legislation should should work its way into priorities. I, I, I mean, when I mention these other issues, it seems that members of both parties are, are talking about the possibility of legislation being put forward on on immigration reform, on gun control. But but I don't hear many members on on either side talking about climate change. I think it's because uh, the discussion on climate change is being displaced by these uh, self created fiscal cliffs that uh, that we're trying to deal with in an environment of uh, partisan gridlock. It seems to me, uh, in the areas that you just mentioned, there is a little bit of warming, if you will, or a little bit of progress, glacial type of progress, related to um, immigration, for example. We need to, first of all, stop the, uh, the argument about is climate change real or not, get rid of the junk science, listen to the Department of Defense, listen to the, the National Academy of Sciences, the CIA, and other well-established conservative organizations, conservative in terms of their scientific approach, and, and really say, okay, it's real, what can we do about it? And then there's a whole host of policies that can uh, roll out of that, things like a clean energy standard for the United States, investments in infrastructure, in the United States and in uh, other key parts of the world where we have uh, national interests at, at stake so that we become much more resilient. The, the Superstorm Sandy experience is, is illustrative here. Because of Sandy, we are paying a bill of about $60 billion uh, in uh, reconstruction and, and other uh, expenses that were caused by that major weather event. That's the latest. It will not be the last, and we need to understand that we can build our infrastructure not just the way it was always before, but the way it has to be to be much more adaptable and resilient to future weather events, not just in the United States but around the world. We're talking to retired Vice Admiral Dennis McGinn, who is not only the president and CEO of the American Council on Renewable Energy, but you are also the signatory to um, a letter, an open letter, signed by a group organized by the Partnership for a Secure America, and it focuses, this letter focuses on addressing climate change in poor nations. One of the uh, issues or one of the uh, items that are uh, that is talked about in this letter, it warns that climate change impacts abroad could spur mass migrations, influence civil conflict, and ultimately lead to a more unpredictable world for our listeners, Admiral, explain in, I think, in greater detail rather than, you know, in those general terms, what you are warning, what your group is sure. warning could happen unless some sort of action is taken in regards to climate change. Well, to do that, let me use an example sure. of pa Pakistan. Pakistan uh, is a large nuclear-armed country, has many traditional rivals uh, in the region specifically with, uh, with India. It has uh, many internal ethnic rivalries, religious rivalries. It is, in many ways, 
bordering on a on an unstable or or uh, very weakly stable uh, society and government. Add to that a couple of really bad floods. They had one a couple of years ago that uh, displaced 20 million people from their from their homes for uh, almost a half a year. You increase uh, the amount of uh, droughts that are affecting the major rivers that uh, provide farming water and, and the basic human needs water for, for Pakistan, and you just add a tremendous amount of pressure to a society and a government that is, at, at, in the best of times, just barely making it. And, oh, by the way, they have nuclear weapons, not a pretty picture for national security in, in a regional sense and really in the global sense. How long does it take, Admiral, to turn things around? Uh, you know, you mentioned Pakistan. How long does it take, you know, to pass legislation uh, that would impact uh, this issue of climate change in the third world so that we're not necessarily worrying about these types of incidences that you just mentioned? I think basically uh, in the near term, working with our United States military and other uh, instruments of, of government in the national security realm, uh, including uh, the State Department, USAID, and introducing some of the technologies that uh, aren't business as usual but represent a better way of producing water, food, and, uh, and electricity that uh, aren't producing greenhouse gases that don't uh, affect local environments and certainly not uh, global environments. I think working with uh, mil the militaries of of uh, these countries. There's been great military to military cooperation over the years uh, around the world by our, our U.S. military. And I think uh, having them, those other militaries, adopt some of the ways that our U.S. forces, Army, Navy, Air Force, and Marines are doing in terms of the greater energy efficiency or energy productivity and greater use of renewable energy are just a couple of ways uh, early on that we could do this. And then I think in a private sector sense, Putting the United States through policy, uh, moving towards a clean energy economy, and having uh, our our businesses or multinational uh, corporations making very good profits in producing and deploying technologies that are going to produce an immediate benefit in terms of quality of life and a, a longer-term benefit in terms of uh, more resiliency in the face of climate change and uh, less and mitigation of the worst effects of, of uh, global warming. Are these countries in the less developed world, Admiral, open to the kinds of uh, changes that, that you're putting forward? You mentioned India, for instance, and, and India uh, is a, a, one of the world's leading growing uh, polluters out there. Um, and I'm wondering if you think a, 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 a country like India would be open to some of the reforms that you're suggesting. They are very much. I'll use the example of China, another great power and, and very rapidly growing power. Uh, a couple of uh, weeks ago, probably about two months or six weeks ago, they had the worst pollution, local pollution alert in the, the uh, Beijing area. Uh, there are about three different uh, periods in January and leading into February where literally businesses had to shut down. People were flooding emergency rooms and medical clinics because of the poor air quality. So th that's just the, the visible uh, uh, capital of, of China. In many other regions of the, the country, they are suffering the effects of uh, short-term energy policies, and they are keenly interested in getting more and more clean energy. In India, to the, the, the key question, Yes, they are very, very interested in doing this. It always comes down to a question of affordability. But when you can make the case that it is cheaper to invest now in clean energy technology, better water product productivity, better uh, outcomes for uh, people who right now may not even have uh, electricity, uh, it, it is a very compelling case in there, especially when you can create local industries in a country like India where they're producing uh, solar panels, they're producing uh, wind turbines, they're producing ocean energy uh, turbines that can uh, really make a difference. Now, your letter is focused on what policymakers in Washington should be doing. You, you are by no means suggesting a unilateral U.S. approach. Are, are other G8 countries on board with the kinds of reforms you're suggesting? 
I think for the most part they are. Certainly the European uh, countries in the G8 are. Uh, I think uh, China, for m- many reasons, not uh, not the, the least of which is uh, the effects of dealing with instability caused by uh, local environmental issues, like I just described, is interested. So, yeah, there is progress, I think, in the, uh, in the G8 in doing this. This isn't a, a unilateral thing. While our letter focused on the United States, it was with the understanding and the firm belief that the United States is in the best position in the world to lead. And we can do it in a way that isn't just a foreign uh, aid giveaway, but rather puts the United States in a technological and a moral leadership position to really address this growing problem of climate change. So your group had this Capitol Hill event rolling out the letter. What are the next steps that you have in mind? Uh, individual meetings with members of, uh, of Congress, members of the administration. I think uh, going back to your very first uh, question, uh, the timing now, while it may be not good in terms of uh, this week or the next next month or a couple of months related to sequestration or uh, continuing resolution, this is a problem and a solution set that's going to have many, many conversations going forward with the administration as well as up on Capitol Hill. We just there have been many cases in uh, over the past oh five years that I can think of where there has been some fairly significant discussions in the Congress at committee level certainly and occasionally on the floor about dealing with uh, with uh, climate change. We want those conversations to uh, be much more visible and uh, lead to actual policy and legislation that will uh, put the United States in a much better place economically energy security-wise, and certainly environmentally. Are the roadblocks that you may be facing in Congress, are they uh, more Republicans? Are they more Democrats, uh, both parties? Um, give me a sense about who, who do you think you need to reach out to the most? Well, I, I don't want to stereotype any of the, the, the good people that, that, that serve. Uh, generally speaking, uh, the Democrat Democrats in Congress have been more open to the idea of uh, climate change legislation than Republicans. But I think a lot of that may have to do with how the, uh, the challenge was, uh, was characterized. We are characterizing it using good, objective data, scientific data, economic data, as a national security issue, which traditionally has been very, very bipartisan. And we've got some really uh, great uh, leaders on both sides of the aisle that really understand this. Admiral Dennis McGinn, you are the uh, CEO and president of the American Council on Renewable Energy. You also are one of those people who is a major supporter uh, on this push to address climate change, a signatory to uh, a letter, which uh, a bipartisan letter, uh, which was introduced this past week. Thank you so much for being on POTUS On Call today. Thanks for uh, uh, taking our, our, the questions from me, and also we're going to get some questions from our listeners in, in just a moment. Have a great hey, day, great. and thanks for being on. Thank you, John. And just one point to, to your listeners, this is real. It isn't uh, partisanship. Uh, all of the signatories to that letter don't have business interests in this. This is just because we all care very much about the future security of this country.